The New Hampshire primary and its time-honored process of getting presidential contenders as close to the people as possible has weathered some criticism this cycle. But the campaigns that are succeeding right now have found a way to connect through our new digital reality while also paying due attention to first-in-the-nation voters. In fact, some campaigns are now doubling down on New Hampshire. The state is the state that they think could launch them to the White House. And one is Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado. Thanks for having Senator, me, Adam. Thanks for being Great here. To be back. So, uh, you're still working towards the back of the pack, but there are some good signs developing for you here. What's the strategy moving forward in New the Hampshire? The strategy moving forward is that we're going to have 50 town halls in New Hampshire between now and the primary. Uh, I'm going to answer every single question. I'm going to tell the truth, which I always do. Meet people in their living rooms and in their businesses, and I believe uh, build momentum coming out of New Hampshire. You were one of the first to really vocally stand up against Senator Elizabeth Warren on the Medicare for All issue. We see her momentum is kind of stalled right now. Do you think your arguments have made a difference in sort of changing the outcome I, of the race right I, now? I do. You know, I'm the only person in this race that's fought for a public option for the last 10 years since we passed the Affordable Care Act. Nobody else can say that. And I'm the only person who wrote the bill. And it was very clear to me that the politics of Medicare for All were going to be toxic for the Democratic Party. And, and I'm glad that now we're realizing that and Elizabeth Warren seems to be backing off her position uh, and people you know don't think that we should follow Bernie Sanders over this ideological waterfall of his we have got to create universal health care for the American people I think we can do it in three years with my plan what we can't do is spend the next 10 years fighting a losing battle for Medicare for all when what we've got to be fighting for is an economy that works better for everybody jobs that pay more in this economy the chance for people to retire with dignity and a decent education for kids in America that's what we need to be focused on this may be kind of philosophical but why is it in the greatest country on earth with the, the richest country on earth why is it we can't have health care for everyone it's an outrage we should have health care for everybody I think it's a moral outrage and I think it's an economic outrage I just think the best way to get there is with the public option that I've proposed I think that we can get there in three years whereas if we do it with Medicare for all we'll never get there because we'll never win uh, some developing news this morning sounds like another mass shooting uh, as we record here on Friday morning in Pensacola Florida Naval Air Station still facts coming in a uh, number of people wounded or injured it appears What's your plan uh, to end mass shootings? You know, we, we've seen mass shootings in Colorado for the, for the last 25 years. My kids are 20, 19, and 15. I believe we should pass the background checks that Nancy Pelosi has passed in the House. We passed those in Colorado almost 20 years ago after Columbine, the same ones. And every year, 2 or 3% of the people that try to buy a gun uh, are denied a gun because they're murderers and rapists and domestic abusers, people that don't need to have a firearm. Uh, I also believe that we should limit the size of magazines. Nobody needs a hundred round magazine in this country and after the Aurora movie theater shooting uh, we limited the size of magazines in Colorado. We're a western state. We're a second amendment state but that doesn't mean that you don't do anything and our kids have grown up believing that the United States Congress has been captured by the NRA and we've got to change that. Do you believe that Beto O'Rourke made it more difficult? We don't hear a lot of Democrats talking. I'm sure this will bring the issue up again, but guns have kind of fallen by the wayside. Do you think that Beto O'Rourke's plan for mass confiscation scared some people off? I think it did scare people off, and I think where we need to be focused is on the common sense reforms that, that we can get done and will make a difference. It would have made a difference to Colorado if, if that guy didn't have a 100-round magazine you know, and was limited to five, let's say. It would have made a difference if we had background checks and and that's what we got to keep fighting for right now Washington is hyper focused on impeachment but when you talk to voters out here on the first of the nation campaign trail it's not issue one it might not even be in the top five or top ten what does that tell you about the political merits of this case moving forward? I think that politics doesn't have anything to do with it and, uh, you know Donald Trump forced this on himself he gave Nancy Pelosi no choice we're gonna go through this process I hope that as we go through the process we remind everybody in America why why it's important for us to subscribe to the rule of law and why the president is not above the rule of law but the reality is we're going to end up fighting this out at the ballot box and I think one of the things we can show the American people is Donald Trump doesn't believe in fundamental aspects of the democracy he doesn't believe in separation of powers he doesn't believe in the independence of the judiciary he doesn't believe that he's um, uh, that, that the, the law applies to him I mean he's still fighting
asking to keep his tax returns a secret. And this is the kind of stuff we got to get past. And we need a president who will actually get up in the morning telling us the truth instead of spending all day watching cable television and then lying to the American people. We can do better than that. How does your campaign survive if you are stuck at your desk in an impeachment trial in January? It's going to be hard, and we're going to have to be imaginative. I mean, I made that promise knowing that, um, that it was possible that we'd have the, this impeachment trial, and we're going to have to figure out virtual ways of doing it in the evenings while I'm there. But I've got a constitutional obligation, just like everybody, the person who's in the Senate who's in this race, and I intend to fulfill that. Which is quite a few of you. It, it you is, know, yeah. Two of the candidates who are not going to be stuck in the Senate, Vice President Biden and Pete Buttigieg, yeah. uh, who are doing fairly well right now, and they're in that lane that you need to get through. It seems like with Mayor Pete, uh, he seems to annoy some of the uh, candidates, his success just coming out of nowhere. Is this Pete, did he annoy you? Well, he doesn't annoy me. I mean, I'm, I, I actually like the guy. I think he's really smart, and I think that he's got an incredibly, uh, he's got a great gift in his, the way he speaks. But, you know, I am so much more experienced than Mayor Pete. I mean, the city that he, uh, that he represented, where, by the way, you get elected mayor by winning 8,000 votes. It's like a school board race in a lot of places. That city had a budget that was a third the size of my old school district's budget. On top of that, I've had 10 years in the Senate to understand what the nature of the corruption is there, how you can get stuff in a bipartisan way, but why the biggest stuff in Washington doesn't get done. I think it's going to be very hard for somebody from a tiny city in, in Indianapolis to be able to hit the ground running. And, and that's what's at stake in this election. We've got, to elect some, we've got to nominate somebody who can beat Donald Trump. I think going to the vice president, we need somebody from a different generation. You know, we don't need to uh, nominate somebody from the generation of the Iraq War and from an economy that hasn't worked well for the American people. And we got to start moving the country forward. And that's why I've stayed in this race. It's not been easy to do. Uh, I'm not as well known as the other candidates, and I've had challenges uh, raising money because of, because of the debate rules and other things. But I really believe I'm where New Hampshire voters are. You know, if I look at the politics of Gene Shaheen and Maggie Hassan, I recognize myself in those politics. And I believe that those are the politics that will ultimately beat Donald Trump. I think far left ideology is not going to beat Donald Trump. A lack of experience is not going to beat Donald Trump. I think I can beat Donald Trump. Let's move to some foreign policy. If you you're in the Oval Office right now. What would be your approach to what's going on in Iran with those protests? It would be to, first of all, sanction Iran for killing its own citizens, uh, and it would be put it, pulling together the coalition of people that supported the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, you know, I, in my view, the people that are most anxious to have Trump reelected at this point are Vladimir Putin, the Iranians, and the Chinese, because they're basically able to get away with whatever they want to do as long as they don't show up on Fox News. And that's a result of the carelessness and the weakness of President Trump when it comes to foreign policy. We need to reestablish our alliances, not just around Iran, but in Europe as well, to push back on these dictators around the world. And we've seen what happens when America doesn't lead. It's not a pretty picture. Is it irrational to ask Iran for greater protections of human rights while you're negotiating the nuclear deal, or does that have to be something? No, I don't think it's irrational at all. In fact, for, for many years, that's the way we conducted our foreign policy. We negotiated nuclear deals with the Soviet Union while we said what you're doing to Soviet Jews is totally unacceptable. We negotiated with China when we said what you're doing is totally unacceptable. Now we have a president who can't, can't negotiate with dictators. They push back on him at all and he collapses and he abandons our values at the same time. So in China, he won't stand up for Hong Kong. In, in Iran, he won't stand up for the 1,000 people that have been killed there. In Russia, he won't stand up for, you know, the folks in Ukraine. And he won't stand up for journalists, you know, who are killed by the Saudis. These are things that we have to lead on because if we don't lead, no one else will. And the world will be a far more dangerous place as it is. It is much more dangerous today than it was when Donald Trump became president. Some of the video coming out of that NATO summit it looked like some world leaders were there basically laughing right. at Donald Trump. When, if you become president, do you have to go to someone like a Trudeau and say something like, hey, uh, 
I don't care what you think about Donald Trump, but I don't ever want to see you laughing at an American president. I, I think that actually you should uh, earn their trust and earn their confidence by not being a laughing stock. You know, I don't think you need to go to them and say, hey, you better not laugh at me. I'm the president of the United States. That in itself is laughable. You got to earn it, you know. And Teddy Roosevelt was the one who said, walk softly and carry a big stick. I think that's, that was good a good philosophy then, it's a good philosophy today. Donald Trump is exactly the opposite, which is talk and talk and talk and talk and be weak. And I believe I can earn the trust of these leaders back. And in fact, the, the very first trip I would take would be to Europe to say, we understand that this transatlantic alliance that we've had for 70 years since we defeated fascism in World War II uh, it is on all of our interests and our national security interests uh, to work together to push back on the Russian threat. Senator Bennett, thanks for joining us. Thanks on for having me, Adam. I appreciate your time. If people go to Michael Bennett slash New Hampshire, they'll find a, a town hall that's near them. And we'll be going to a few of those ourselves. Good, so great. see you there.